Uh, this is the first video in the new series I'm doing on uh, the greatest atomic players uh, throughout the years. Uh, and this video is going to focus mainly on um, the chess kid. Um, so m many people perhaps won't really know very much about the chess kid um, because it's been some time since he was uh, really active and, and dominant in the chess world. But when I started playing in um, the summer of 2002, um, well, at least the earliest recollection I have it, from when looking at the best list on the ICC, which was pretty much the, the premier um, playing site for, for Atomic at the time. He was the number one player there. And he stayed that way for, for quite some time. Um, and so anyone that sort of, was sort of active in the early 2000s, early mid 2000s, especially on the ICC, will, will know that he is, you know, he's an Atomic legend and um, a very, very strong player. Um, and he was pretty much clearly the top player, I think, in the world between 2002 and certainly up to 2004. He was, well, in my mind, I mean, I was very active in those years and he was the clear number one. Um, and he continued to rank number one on, on the ICC server um, quite very regularly for many years after that as well. Um, but he, he wasn't the first on my player, as this is the first video in a and I'm going to do these in roughly, in, well, basically in chronological order, the players. Um, I think it's a good opportunity to talk about players from before that time because um, a very good, a very good resource for atomic history, which I'll put a, a link to it in in the the, um, the video notes, is a Chronotogs website. Um, and on there he has the history of atomic chess, um, and he shows basically some timelines of different what you call different eras of atomic. And the first, what, the fir what he thought was the first era, the golden era on there, on his on his site is from when the game Atomic was introduced on the web, which was actually 1995. Um, bearing in mind I started playing in 2002, so there's seven years there, quite a long time um, before I can really talk with any authority about who the best players were. From 1995 up until 2000, um, the game was mostly played on fairly small servers particularly a site called um, Mewis, um, which was a wild, basically uh, it was a specialised website just to play um, different variants of chess. And on there, there was an Atomic World Championship held in, in 1998, which was won by um, a player of a nickname of uh, Grastrea. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but again, you can go to Talk's website for, for more information to read about it. Um, and so this was very early days. I think the players were really pioneering the game, just playing the very first... Well, it was introduced on a site called Gix, which was a German website. And shortly after that, it was introduced on this, this Muist, this wild website, which I think was the site where the, most of the strong players played. Um, but if you look at... Because on, on, on the website, it does show some, some notes and some statistics for these players. And the winner of that World Championship... Um, so Crash Drow, he only played 160 Atomic games on on Mewis, um, and that's over a period of years. And similarly, his opponent in the final played a grand total on on Mewis of 387 games. So, and also it's kind of hinted at in those web pages that Atomic was very rarely played. It was a, um, kind of occasionally played a bit of a, a fun variant that no one really knew about, and so. You had very early people dipping their toes into it, and those players were perhaps the best of those that crop of players, but didn't have very much experience. They didn't have any many players that they could actually play against. And if you think about it, so 160 games total rated games that the world champion played, many of those would have been against complete beginners, I expect. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to kind of believe that I mean these players would have been. That would have been that strong. I mean, perhaps I'm wrong on that. Um, maybe they played a lot of unrated games and analysed a lot with each other. But as I don't have any, I don't have any games to see from those players. In my mind, I've always thought. I mean, these guys were early pioneers. They probably came up with a lot of the early tactics and and thinking about the game for the first time. But it would have been probably from 2000 onwards when quite an important thing happened. Uh, and Atomic was introduced onto both the ICC. And another main server, uh, USCL, so US Chess Live um, server, and there it was introduced to 
a significantly higher number of players. So it wasn't just being played on small, um, off-the-radar sites anymore. It was on two of the, the largest websites, particularly ICC, I think, was, was huge um, at that time. And from that point on, players started, started playing a lot. And therefore, many, many more games were, were played. Um, and before the chess kid, I know that the one of the um, very strongest players on uh, on ICC was a player called Duke Nukim. That was his nickname. He was a FIDE master, later became an international master. And I was, this is his um, wild ratings on, on the ICC. And you can see, so Atomic is wild 27. It's worth pointing out at this point, so ICC's version of Atomic is is slightly different to what many people will be aware of, for example, what's played on Lee Chess. And that's because the Wild 27, so as it was played on, on the ICC, it had no check, um, which had a few implications. Most um, most commonly in the end game, um, because there's no stalemate. So, in fact, that, that itself has a couple of implications. One is that often the winning techniques are a little bit simpler because you don't have to worry about some drawing um, drawing issues of giving stalemates. So a lot of things like winning with two queens against the king um, is a lot simpler. And also it has some others, uh, some other implications are that in time scrambles, for example, you can't so easily pre-move to checkmate because your, oppo your opponent can make um, unexpected moves with the king just to escape um, from, from the checkmate. And you have to be aware, like if you only have a couple of seconds left, you have to be quite alert to that and uh, ready to capture their king. But probably the, the biggest um, difference in, in favour of the atomic rules on, on ICC, so the Wild 27 rules, is that you can castle through check, which is quite useful, particularly as black is the one that's usually withstanding the initiative. And that can be useful as a defensive resource sometimes to get away from a check. Um, but this is Duke Nukem's Wild ratings. So this there was a computer that was set up on ICC in order to split out the different wild variants. So most people, they would just have what they would have one wild rating, which would be a combination of all these. Um, and at some point, a, a bot was, was written in order to capture the individual ratings. And this happened at some point after, two th after it was introduced. I'm not sure exactly when. Um, so if you look on the ICC at some of the older type players that played in 2000, they don't have any ratings on the, on here, but they certainly did play Wild 27. So they only captured it from a certain point. I'm not sure exactly what date that was. But you can see here, this is Duke Nukem's account uh, rating. So he played a fair number of games, 887, that were captured by this engine, Robo Kiev. Um, and he had a rating, a maximum rating over 2300. And he was the first player to break that, that um, barrier on, on ICC. Um, I didn't play him very much myself, I played him two games um, because he stopped playing before I started and later he came back for one tournament um, or at least one tournament I saw him in and I played him in that and we and I can tell you he was a very, very strong player, he did quite well in the tournament and we had one win each and this was a time when I was already a strong player. Um, so he was, he was certainly um, one of the strong early players. Another player who I can't get the, the list for because ICC deletes accounts was a player called a high school boy um, who I played a lot in my early atomic uh, days. So while I was probably quite a long way off from being a top player, uh, I think at that point the top players were still around 2300 and my rating was probably something 17 or 1800 so I was quite a long way down. But he actually played me quite a few games. At that time it was very hard to find opponents. so. He was probably quite happy to just play somebody that was keen to play, and you know he, those matches taught me quite a lot. Um, you know, generally like I got beaten up quite badly, but my score steadily improved. And then at some point he he also stopped playing. Um, but I'll just show you that this is the Chess Kid's um, uh, wild ratings. So you can see there his his atomic rating. Um, this was something I just took about a week ago, so they're all quite inactive now. His final rating, well, it may not be final, I mean, maybe he'll play a few more games, although I don't know, but it's there's pretty much no Atomic going on on that website anymore. Um, he, see, he played over 22,000 games. Um, quite a difference to these early players that are playing maybe a couple of hundred games. 
uh, and he had a all-time high rating of 25.39, which was a, a server record. Um, well, I think it's, it's probably it is the server record. I'm sure it still stands. Um, and so he wasn't probably the first strong player, but he was really um, the first strong player that I had a lot of experience uh, playing with, certainly after I became a good player. And so he's kind of the first player I would talk about with, with confidence as being really a kind of an all-time great atomic player. And he really stood out from what I had seen from the previous uh, pre older players, like older strong players. I came into contact with quite a few of them over, over the years. And yeah, his style was quite different. It was much more positional. Well, he had, seemed to have a much better understanding of, of atomic. And older players that I played had a much far looser tactical style. Certainly players that have played in the 90s. They had some tactical tricks in their arsenal and they would sacrifice certain elements of their position in order just to try and trick you and get these tricks in. And Fuchesky's style was a lot more, he would slowly build up his position. He, un he understood and saw all these tactics, the same tactics that these other players tried to spring on him. But he wouldn't sacrifice any, or he wouldn't intentionally make any positional sacrifices, or I mean strategic sacrifices in order to to sort of make those threats. He would slowly build up and his position would just kind of get better and better and then he'd and then he'd ultimately win most of his games. And he did this playing almost exclusively bullet. Like on the ICC it was all bullet chess. Um, either one one plus zero or or more often zero plus one. And so he would play in his in his style I kind of I kind of thought of it as like a it's kind of like an accountant style. Like he would just play safe moves and he would sort of pick up a pawn and then try and exchange pieces or, or if he had a clear attack then obviously he'd go for that but generally he would play safely and just kind of it, collect his opponent's um, gifts throughout the game and at that time the level of opposition was not as high as it is now and there was a, quite a lot of loose play like I mentioned earlier people would sacrifice pawns or pieces just to try and get an attack going which wasn't necessarily justified and he would just pick off that material absorb the pressure and then win the game and that had a big influence on my style um, I kind of saw that as being you know he was the, by far the best player and I thought this is what I need to do to become you know become like Vicheski I have to I have to be good enough in order to um, win games in this smooth way without having to kind of create unnecessary complications um, and he did his playing on feel. I mean, he, he had a very good feeling. This was obviously, of course, far in the pre-computer, pre-Stockfish era. He played on, it was far less kind of, um, cal I think it was a lot less calculation. Also because it was bullet, it was played in uh, on a lot more on feel and uh, understanding of the game. And it was less theoretical in general. Um, in terms of openings, he did have quite a big impact, particularly in one opening which is his, his favourite opening was to develop with the move knight h3 followed by e4 and then usually knight, this knight would develop to a3 followed by pushing his other pawn to the centre. And players that are active now will, will recognise that this is still um, a very common, in fact probably one of the most common positional ways to play in the Tomic. Um, and he understood the plans and approaches in this opening um, incredibly well. Uh, one in particular which I'm going to go into into now I think was there are a lot of often in this kind of setup. Um, it might be a little bit hard to visualise if you haven't seen it before, but I'll get to that in a minute. He would play pawn to c3, and there would be all sorts of tactics along this diagonal, particularly if blacks try to challenge in the centre. Um, so if I go on to some of these games, these are games which um, the chess kid played on on uh, fix, so free freechess.org. A little bit beyond his peak, so this was in the year t 2012. And this was his nickname, Jesse Pinkman. Obviously a bit of a Breaking Bad fan, I expect. Um, and in these games, you'll, you'll see this, this tactic in action. Um, may, many of you may already have known this tactic, but if not, it's a very useful one to know if you want to play um, games with the pawns in the centre like this. If Black wants to challenge you with e5, which is you know quite a natural move, and I often used to do this uh, in my games against him, and I would be very aware that you have to be very very um, you have to be very careful about um, tactics along this diagonal and in these games you'll s that I've picked out here you'll see him doing it and I used to know in advance before I played him 
I have to be careful about this diagonal. I have to be careful about it. And yet I'd still get hit with it. I mean, he just understood the tactics related to it so well that, and it was very hard to keep it under control in, in bullet games. Um, so he plays the move c3. This is kind of opening up this move, the queen, in the future. At the moment, it's not possible because uh, this knight is attacked by, by the bishop. So, but it's one, one, one thing that may happen in the future. His opponent plays c6, just a kind of natural move. You can see this is just the opening book on Lee Chess here. You can see that some games have played like this. He plays f3, generally it's a useful move. Um, often g3, you'll see in most of these games, he often plays these slow improving moves. And then when there aren't any improving moves left, then he starts playing along on this, this diagonal. That was the way he um, he attempted to approach it. Bishop e7, quite quite normal. He's threatening to play bishop h4. So g3, bishop h4, knight g5, and captures. Um, in fact, you can see here is a game by VT Chess. This is also um, the chess kid's handle on uh, on Lee Chess, um, which he set up. You know, obviously some years after after this game. Bishop h3. Um, so. What, he could start with e takes d5. I can see that's been played in a couple of games. But probably he thought, if I take on d5 and then try and play queen b3 quickly, you know, bishop e6 has to be calculated. Um, or some variations of bishop e6 has to be calculated. Throwing in bishop h3 first, um, I'm not sure if it's better or not, but it's kind of interesting just to, just to clarify the situation with those light square bishops and then go for e takes d5. Now, queen b3 is a huge threat. And... Um, Black, in fact, didn't really um, do anything about it. He just played knight d7, queen b3, and it's game over. Black black resigns because the pressure on f7 is just so strong. Um, so I'm going to go through... I've got five examples here. I go. This one is also a fairly simple one. I think I'll just play through the first moves quite quickly. In this case, black is set up with e6 and d5, but on the next move he plays e5. So in fact, he's, a to he's actually a tempo down on the previous line. Um, g3, again a useful move, bishop e7. Um, unlike the last time, Mischewski doesn't play f3 here. He decides he's not wasting time in this game and just plays e takes d5. Bishop h4, takes takes, and then if you've seen the last game, you'll see, you'll, you'll know exactly what's coming. Bishop h3, bishop g4, perhaps black was hoping for f3 here, but it's not necessary. Just queen b3. And again, this diagonal wins the day. Um, so those are two quite simple examples, but the, what we'll see in these um, next few games are that what happens if black's not quite so um, accommodating? Like what happens if black um, doesn't get rid of that dark square bishop? Uh, so he's played in very similar style. In fact, this this f6 move might look a bit silly, and it doesn't really help the knight on on g8. But it does mean that when or if a queen gets to the b3 square, it won't be gaining a tempo on the pawn on f7. But the chess kid goes for e takes d5 anyway. Um, so queen b3 is not directly threatened because, again, this knight's still under threat. Um, but okay, so black pushes e4. Uh, bishop e3. I'm not going to come, I'm not sure if these are the, the absolute best moves or not, but generally this is just to get an idea of his tactic. It's just um, some illustrative games. Black plays knight to e7, um, probably hoping to kind of jump with this knight, perhaps to one of these squares. Uh, might might be good if he's given if he's given a couple of moves. And now a common move in this in this position, um, knight c4. Now quite a quite a good move here, I think. Also would be d5. This is a look, this is kind of makes um, shows this move knight e7 to probably be a bit weak. You're threatening to play d6. I'm not quite sure why this move wasn't played. It's possible that something like queen d6. Um, again, I mean these are all one-minute games, so I'm not sure. Perhaps something like this might have, might have spooked might have spooked um, uh, the chess kid. Like I mean, Black's getting some counterplay perhaps. So he decides, okay, I'm going to play knight c4 first. Now after takes d5. If um, Black plays queen d6 then white can kind of choose one of these checks now that the pawn on b5 is gone. Um, it's a little bit perhaps more simple to, to refute that. Um, not e I think what black is pretty much busted here. d6 is coming very quickly and it comes in 
knight d7 and att uh, knight d4 and attempt to kind of confuse things to kind of come in with 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 the knight but after d7 the game's over i mean queen h5 as this arrow illustrates would pretty much win the game but um what what the chess kid plays is also pretty conclusive and also plays to our theme of uh, of this diagonal so he play, puts the king to e7 and then sacrifices and queen d6 now is unstoppable queen d5 and uh, and white wins again winning along this diagonal next example oh dear apologies so the next example um black probably plays it's actually if you notice it's actually the same player that was from the first example and this was in this a series of games this one was after the first one black i have some sympathy for this because i've actually done this myself on a, on a couple of the on some occasions pushing this pawn up so you probably thought, okay, I mean, you got me with queen b3 in the last game. There's no way that's happening again. You know, I'm just going to push this pawn up, and you know, good luck, good luck, getting in that tactic again. Well, let's see what happens, right? So f3, again, a useful move, often played um, in this in this type of position. Bishop b7, and now, now that there's no obvious useful improving moves, it's time for action. E takes d5, opening up. Um, Opening up again these these light squares. Black thinks, well, I've got that under control, right? So he plays c6. Um, quite a typical move as well. Um, not sure that's the best move, but again, fairly typical for these types of positions. Perhaps hoping to uh, kind of push this pawn on. Not quite sure what Black's thought process was, but the chess kid plays knight c4, um, showing another typical tactic uh, for this for this variation. Um, and finally, actually, you can see so there's a game that's been played here by Mr. Hasbin against Cure for Pain. This shows that perhaps I I learnt my lessons quite well because Mr. Hasbin was one of my um, one of my accounts uh, when I was uh, shaking off some rust at some point. I think in advance, perhaps of the 2016 World Championship. And so we pretty much played exactly the same game here. So knight c4, bishop c4. Again, just using a different piece on that same soft diagonal. Bishop e6, win a piece. And then at this point, I mean, white's got a pretty great position here. Um, and in this game, after f4, he followed up with another another temporary sacrifice, knight f4, jumping in with the knight. Oh, and, you know, black had already seen enough and, and resigned the game. This obviously can't be taken because queen e2 um, would end in checkmate shortly. The final game, um, so again, this last one showed a knight c4 tactic. What if um, black really kind of does this a different way? So he kind of tries to shut that down completely, like, you know, how are you going to get in knight c4 now? Um, or queen b3. Well, again, let's, let's, see what, let's see what the chess kid does. So f3, uh, bishop e7. Again, now all the useful moves have been played. It's time to, time to open up the light squares. Black thinks, well, okay, I mean, I don't really need this pressure on, on the, the knight anymore, and perhaps he's worried about some knight f4 jump. Um, so he decides, okay, I'm, I'm going to exchange off that, that knight. Quite a typical operation. And now now knight c4, um, well, it isn't possible, or it seems like it's not possible, but in fact, knight takes c4. Nice move. Um, giving up a whole tempo just to create this threat, just to open up these light squares. And um, turns out it's not so simple to, to defend. Um, black plays bishop b7, um, probably thinking, okay, well, if he plays queen b3, I'm just going to be able to block that with the bishop. In fact, that's not, that's not true. Um, it, you can't really block the queen out. And in fact, queen b3 is, is a winning move here because it can follow up with queen b4. And now these, lights, these dark squares are also weak. Uh, I mean, it's a one-minute game, so it's easy. I mean, we can forgive White for playing a slightly suboptimal move. It's quite a natural move that he often plays in these positions, bishop h3. But then after f4, he doesn't um, need uh, he um, doesn't need to be asked again. Plays queen b3, queen b4, and and White wins. Um, so there we go. So I mean. When I think of my early games with the chess kid, I often think of these tactics along this diagonal and his really good understanding of playing these structures. And it's quite striking looking at these games. These games were from 2012, where on on free chess, 
but he was doing exactly the same exactly the same things exactly the same moves um as early as I can recall 2002 2003 um in those days on ICC now if we go through sort of a timeline of of the chess kids um, atomic uh, atomic playing days um as I said I mean he was mainly active in those early mid 2000s on the ICC and he was um he did take part in the atomic world championship from 2005 um so this was organized and organized by Chronotog and it was run on on uh, free chess which wasn't his favored site um as I say he, yeah he was always playing on the ICC very rarely came over he came over for a little bit and he did play in that tournament but he um by that point 2005 there was already a quite a lot of um, competition, I guess, for, for the best player, um, both from, from myself and also from uh, Siggy Manon, a very strong player who, who was, um, whose home server was, was Free Chess. And he, he took part in that Atomic World Championship. He won his first two matches and he got through to, um, cause there are only 16, I think there are only 16 players, so he got through the round of 16, the round of eight, and then he was paired in the semi-final against Siggy Manon, and he um, decided to forfeit that match, which was a bit of a surprise at the time. I was kind of really looking forward to that match. They he did play one match with with Siggy Manon on free chess, you know, un, not not related to that tournament where they had drawn I think four all, and it was kind of really interesting to see you know who was going to come out on top. You know, it was kind of a the old strongest player against you know the, kind of the new kid on the block. Um, you know the new, very strong, very strong player, um, and it was very kind of. I wasn't quite sure who who was the favourite for that match. It was very tempting to see that. I felt like Siggy Manon was kind of getting stronger and perhaps had overtaken, but I wasn't wasn't sure. Um, but yeah, he he decided to forfeit that match, um, and I did ask him about it. He, at the time, and I remember him saying, you know, he was quite busy with with some other things, and also he felt that his chances of defeating both Siggy Manon and then myself, who was waiting in the final, were, were perhaps a bit low. Um, and he didn't want to, you know, because of his other commitments, he felt like it wasn't worth, wasn't worth the effort. Um, which is a bit of a shame. And I, um, he also mentioned to me recently in some correspondence about um, the ICC championships, where he um, had some early the ICC basically ran atomic championships on a on an annual basis, and so there'd be one tournament every year which would be labelled as the ICC Championship. And throughout the year, the chess kid would generally be ranked number one, almost all the time on the server. But in some of those championships, he generally didn't. When he played, he didn't actually win the, win them. He um, Molten Thinker, I think, won about four in a row. Um, they were at first only one one plus zero, and later on. Um, they introduced a three plus zero championship, and he had some very disappointing, well for him, disappointing results. I mean, not winning for him would, would be quite a big disappointment. And then he decided to sit out a few of them um, because he just felt so, so kind of gutted about not winning. And I don't know if there was an element of he didn't want that in the world championship. Perhaps uh, I'm I'm not sure, or perhaps he kind of was used to being, you know, the standout number one player, which he'd been for several years. I mean, not many players can say that they have been clearly the number one at Atomic, but I think he he can definitely say that. And at, by that point of the world championship, 2005, I think it was no longer really the case. It was gone going from being the best to being one of the best. Um, I don't know some people might take that a little bit differently, and I think perhaps he it kind of he didn't want to be be shown that. Um, that was my impression. Um, perhaps I'm wrong on that, but that was kind of my feeling. And from those that point on, he didn't really take part in any big events. Um, there were a few that were run on fix, and he was contacted about and decided not to play. Um, but he did play. He kept playing on ICC, and um, but things tended to move away. They moved away from ICC onto free chess. And therefore, there was less um, action between him and the other top players, and I think the game did sort of develop and, and move on um, in those later years. Um, but clearly, like these, this account here, this Jesse Pinkman account, he set this up in two thousand and twelve, and 
And I've got another game I'm going to show you here because he played a games, some games against some strong players. He's got a game here against Grand Lapin. Um, he played in, on this account that he set up in 2012. So this was kind of beyond his peak years. He had, wasn't playing very much at this point. He played two games against um, Fast Hand Boy, who is Fast Tsunami on on Lee Chess, who by that point I think was one of the, already one of one of the strongest players, and they had one game each and they only played two games at one all. Obviously a small sample size, but clearly he took a game off Fast Tsunami at that point, so that says something at least. And he played Grand Lap in ten games and he actually came out ahead in those ten games, uh, five and a half, four and a half. Um, and I'm going to show you one of the games here, but I think, you know, just that little snippet just shows you, I mean, if he had remained active, I, there's no doubt in my mind that he would have remained being one of the elite players. And he still would be, I think, if he was still active. Um, it might take some time to adjust because the game has moved on a bit, but um, he did play on Lee Chess as VT Chess, um, and you can look at some of those uh, some of those games. In fact, I put some comments here about um, where you can find some of his games. If you're interested in looking at any of his games, um, some links to to where you can find where you can find those. Um, unfortunately, you know he played so many games on the ICC and they're not available, but there are a few that are available that you can check out if you're interested. Particularly, I think for his his handling in this white opening, I think is um, you know what kind of stands out in my mind. So this is a game against uh, Grand Lapin. It was a one-minute game, so bear that in mind. Um, maybe not be too critical about um, any of the moves. But so he plays his normal, his normal opening. I think in this move order, I mean the most common move these days is d4, just to avoid this queen f6 move, which Grand Lapin, which Grand Lapin plays, which forces the exchange of queens, uh, which which duly happens, and then Black blocks the knight. And this is probably a slightly better version for black than um, with the queens on. Because with the queens on, obviously white has more uh, chances of a strong initiative of a, a, getting a, a winning attack. So, so a few natural moves uh, played. And in this position, I think you can see, so from these games, I mean, f4 has been the most common move. And I think it's probably a slightly better move. But, um, you know, black can might continue this and then play bishop e2 castles. I'll put a link to a game if anyone's interested in looking at that between two two strong players. Um, but the chess kid played e5, which is also you know quite a common move in this in these structures. But White's hoping to play knight f4, um, and Grand Lapin decides you know he plays f4. He's going to stop that. It's again a natural move, gaining space and preventing that aforementioned knight f4 move. And um, it's a shame you can see all these moves coming up, but I guess. Uh, this is quite an interesting moment because I would have thought, I mean, if, if you told me this position and said, uh, what do you think, you know, white play, or what do you think the chess keeper play here, I would go for F3. It just seems like a safe uh, safe move with, you know, balanced chances. Later on, you can you can develop the bishop to D3 and perhaps look to sacrifice on F4 in the future, uh, or perhaps not, depending on how the game, the game progresses. But he went straight for this, bishop takes F4. Uh, you know, really ambitious move. And the idea is just to, well, long, the long-term idea is just to push that f-pawn up the board. And objectively, I think that probably playing with f3 is, is probably better, but this being a bullet game, um, white having a very clear idea, and it's actually not so simple for black to, to neutralise. Um, it's obviously a good, very good practical choice. And so black played um, bishop, f, bishop e7. He, again, so it's a bullet game. All the caveat, all the usual caveats. Knight f6 is um, probably the best move. It's quite, a, quite a strong, a strong move. It kind of sacrificing the piece back in order to fight for the initiative. Um, after knight g5, instead, it leads to a more kind of balanced, interesting, interesting game. But bishop e7, again, you're making decisions for one or two seconds. It's quite a natural move. G3, stopping uh, bishop h4, or at least taking the sting out of bishop h4. Although this is still, I think, probably a natural um, natural move, quite a normal operation for, for black to do. Um, but I think white's doing doing fairly well, just bishop, bishop d3, and if g6, then pushing the f-pawn up, and white um, certainly has at least um, enough compensation for that, that piece that's sacrificed. I would, surely more, actually, I would, I would think I'd much prefer to be white there. 
If Grand Lapin plays uh, Bishop g5, uh, it could also be just a mouse slip, but I'm guessing probably not, but it, I mean, it could be. Um, f4, because it really does help White's plan. He plays f4. And Grand Lapin decides he needs to develop, right? I mean, um, he needs to try and get his um, get his king to safety before White can play Bishop d3, castles, and then open up the, the f file um, and win the game. So he's focused on development, so bishop d3 comes, and uh, castles, getting in castles before bishop g6, check. Uh, bishop h7, I don't think white needed to rush with that move, but it doesn't really ruin very much. And now castles, and now you can see, um, based on these nice colours on the board, um, white's really, really well coordinated, he's ready to try and open up the f-file, while black's um, queenside pieces are all still on their starting squares. And um, yeah, it's probably quite a tricky position for Black. I mean, he should, I think, develop one of these pieces over here. So either Bishop B7 or, or Knight D7. Um, but Grand Lapin decides, okay, I'm going to play Bishop H4. Perhaps he wants to just get the Bishop away from from this potential uh, capture in the future. And after this, F5 comes. Uh, f6 is now a big threat, threatening um, obviously to mate on g7 and a lot of material. So it kind of forces black to, to react, which, which it does, g5. And now a natural move. Um, white did have a, probably a stronger move here of playing um, g4, but again, this is quite hard to see. I think this is probably a hard um, position to get exactly right, even with even at a blitz time control or, or a, a slower time control. Um, the idea is that in this case, after knight g6, you can start pushing these pawns up and really start getting this avalanche of pawns against black's king. Um, but king h1 is a very human move. Um, the idea is that now you're threatening to take on e6 without the explosion on f1. Um, and this sort of, you know, strong positional, um, you know, playing playing by feel, as I said before, is, is the hallmark of the chess kids game. Um, knight takes f, f5. The last chance Black had was really to play knight knight g6, um, or at least the best chance that that that, um, that Black has. But I mean, White clearly has um, a very good position. He can either decide to just push this pawn up and and get a strategic advantage that way, or you can, can consider other um, other moves, perhaps something like bishop g8, aiming to try and open up the the f line while these pieces are still um, still still napping over there. Um, so white would still be for choice, but after knight takes f5, the game is essentially over because down the f-file, um, white wins the game. Um, yeah, so that's the end of... I've put some other games in, in this study. I, I may make this study um, public so people can um, come in and have a look at these these points and also some of these, um, some of these links. Um, but yeah, so this is... Um, the end of the chess kid video so clearly i mean to me he is um an atomic legend uh, one of the one of the greatest players uh, that the game's had uh, and one of the only players who has been sort of head and shoulders i think above his competitors um at any point in a, in um atomic atomic history or at least atomic that i've had experience of um so you know 18 years of atomic um so thanks for watching and the next video will be about um, Molten Thinker, so also known as Smash Time Falls on uh, Lee Chess. So stay tuned for, for that video. Thanks very much.